just got divorced. Well, dearie, sometimes parents fall out of love. But there is the remedy for that. A brand new episode of First Issue Club. <laughs> wow. Wait, are you not a little kid? Yeah, you're not a little kid. You bailed on your character. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, no. no, no. I, 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 if I'm going to commit to Mrs. Doubtfire, <laughs> uh, you, I feel better about myself now. That's very good, young man. On today's show, we're going to cover Teen Titans Special, Modern Fantasy, and Century. All right, everybody. Uh, who do we have in the club today? And if you were the parent of some children and you were getting divorced, what kind of character would you dress up as to save your marriage? So I have to live as this character? You're doing a Mrs. Doubtfire, right? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to call you out real quick. It's a Mrs. Doubtfire situation. Right? Yes. This is Budget King, and I would melt a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man costume to my skin. <laughs> <laughs> so that I would look like a melted marshmallow, but I would also have the sympathy of my children because I was burned permanently. Would they, would they know it's you? <laughs> uh, they would know I'm fluffy. They're young. They're perma-young. I think I've got one. Go for it. I am Caitlin Morosic, and I would be uh, gender-bending. I would be Mrs. Rogers. Mm. I would bond with the kids, and I would try to use that love angle to save the marriage. Would you? Um, and I love cardigans, so it would just be <laughs> staying true to what I wear usually. That's true. You do love cardigans. Yeah, I'm kind of like a toddler grandma fashion aesthetic. <laughs> oh, right. I think toddler <laughs> grandma's well in right now. Is it? Mm -hmm. Damn it. <laughs> uh, my name is Greg Lichtai, and I would dress up as Thomas the Tank Engine. And I would be like the chauffeur character in my life while I'm taking my kids to school and my probably wife to her work. I would try to convince them to reconsider <laughs> because of my criminal past. Um, I don't think money laundering should be a federal offense, but <laughs> this is where we're at in my life. So, um, Mike to Stacy, I would paint myself silver and get in a shipping container and have myself shipped to the house and then when my wife opened the package I would be like I am your husband assistant robot and then the robot could you know ones and zeros my way back into her life like don't you miss having a real life companion let's get this podcast started <laughs> So what's up first, Sentry? <laughs> yeah, Sentry. Oh, we're doing Sentry. We've done some research on Sentry, and Mike, D, kick us into it. Well, we did some research, and what we found is that Sentry's a boring character who can do everything. Uh, this book, on the other hand, I felt was not boring. I enjoyed it quite a bit. The cover is pretty dull. I think based on the cover alone, I like wouldn't have picked this up. What about you guys? Seems kind of generic. It's a, a plain it, Jane. It's a bad superhero costume. The the white shaded font up top that said Lords Lemire is why I would have picked it up. Yeah, we that's like, true. We like Jeff Lemire a lot. So this was written by Jeff Lemire, and I believe art was by Kim Jacinto. Um, so we find him as kind of a washed up superhero. He's a chef in a little diner. The interesting thing is that Doctor Strange has concocted a little machine that allows Sentry to go within to a pocket universe so he can turn into the Sentry version of himself, unleash his powers, because we find out that the Sentry, when he uses his powers, also unleashes a dark force equal to his own power. So I think that there's been a lot of success of taking kind of like lesser known characters and fleshing them out, especially when Jeff Lemire did Animal Man, which we talk about a lot here. Animal Man just went fucking insane and killed it and was like amazing. And I think that Marvel thought, hey, what's one of the weirdo ass uh, superheroes we have? We could get Jeff Lemire to maybe like give us an Animal Man. 
I think he wrote an interesting story, but I think the guidelines of having to write from what century was was the limiting factor here. If we got a story that was just an old guy that's like could destroy the world and has to go escape in this other world to do it, that would have been interesting, but there's kind of some other like hoops he has to jump through that make it a less appealing. Yeah, the baggage that Sentry brings with him is what makes this tedious. Because mm-hmm. I, I had no context for really who the Sentry was, and I, I kind of enjoyed the book, but I guess you're right. There's like a family of superheroes that kind of surrounds him and their relationships and who was real and who wasn't. Like some people have equivalents in this like pocket universe. Yeah, I had no... In his reality. He gets teased by the waitress in real life showing up as Sentress in the pocket universe and I was just yeah. like I guess <laughs> I <don't>, <laughs> sure yeah that's the best review of the book I could possibly well, think of I just I I don't know I feel like this would be one where if you had a, a pre-existing knowledge you might enjoy this a lot more I don't want to say that it's not a good book because I didn't really understand what was happening honestly like this seems like one of those characters that they should have used to critique either Marvel or comics or something like that and instead they kind of like tried to stay true to Sentry and nobody's a Sentry fan nobody no. nobody gives a shit about Sentry yeah nobody has uh Sentry bed sheets right as a kid or <laughs> but know. like like I think they should have gone like booster gold on this or Lobo or something like where it's like they're critiquing the the medium of it instead of just being like, hey, remember this superhero? We got, well, he's old now. He's in the old maniverse and, uh, <laughs> and he's doing like weird shit. It's like, I don't know. Je- I think Jeff Lemire, again, and this happened when we talked about Jason Aaron, he did good with what he was given, mm-hmm. but the task that he was given was stupid. I did, I did <laughs> quite enjoy, I did quite enjoy the first scene where he literally, before you know that he's got this one like time to check in a day he just comes in and there's this like it's the stakes are super high and you've got this villain who's in the core of the moon and he's like he just rips him in half with nothing that was pretty fun honestly (coughs) when the comic book was just like this like superman guy like going fucking nuts and like ripping shit i don't have time like breaks into his speech rips him in half yeah doesn't care about anything and he's like it doesn't matter it's it's all not gonna matter i was like this is cool this is awesome i feel like i had the complete opposite (laughs) experiences you guys had with it because when we started into it i was like yeah it's like super powerful guy and he's just being super powerful like you expect just super generic comics to be and then jeff lemire explores this character's experience with loss of identity and all these interesting things. I felt like everyone might have liked it better if we would have just erased that Sentry was a character previously and and you might need to know anything about him cuz I don't th- I f- kind of feel like you didn't really need to know anything about him. Yeah. Like if he was if you read this and this was Sentry's like first appearance and you knew that, you might just take it like, "Oh, he's this guy, he has a past as a hero. He's holding on to it in this made-up world." which is kind of pathetic, but at the same time, he's his most brutal version of himself there, so that's kind of, like, fun to see. And then he dips back into this world. Um, We see his relationships with some people and the fantasies he's created about those people, which is, like, creepy and honest. And um, So I think I I totally agree with what you said. My problem is the void just seems so clutch to the story and makes no sense to me. And I think that the void is only mm-hmm. shoehorned in here because of it. it's a century thing, and it's like I think everything you just described, if right. it, it just all, you described a great comic book that lacked yeah. the void, they should have just knocked the void out, and I think they would have had a great comic book. Right. I do like how picky I'm being though, because like we always talk about how great it would be if the stories were more personal, and these like giant st- high stakes stories are getting a little old, and I'm like, mm, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I this want him to just didn't. rip shit But then up. we have this. <laughs> but I, That's just me owning being picky with what we've I, said. I kind of feel like this one gives you kind of both. It does. Because uh, at the end of the book, we find that someone has stolen and infiltrated his pocket universe and is creating havoc there. So there's literally a universe at stake on one side of this. And then the other side is... A desperate loser.
Next, we have Modern Fantasy out on Dark Horse. Words and art by Roberts and Goodsnook. Sage of the Riverlands exists in a world where fantasy is already reality, yet she's still searching for adventure and escape, which I thought was pretty interesting in this one that you have. Granted, she has existed in this world for some time, so maybe it's not new to her, but if any of us lived in this world, I would imagine we would be kind of preoccupied with all of the fantastical elements already, but she is kind of living that mundane office life, so it's just kind of interesting to start with. The references to pretty much all thir- all things, <laughs> all things nerd and pop culture are very strong, and they're everywhere in this book. I enjoyed finding like little nuggets here and there. The story itself is kind of like a rough em up on the lamb mob kind of deal, like a little subplot in there. But you've got wizards and lizards and elves and clerics and whatever Bakhtar is <laughs> just there to like flavor it a little bit. It was fun to see mythical creatures play like archetypal, stereotypical roles. Like right. people you'd see at your work. Yes, and, yeah. right. Absolutely. What did you guys think about the plot in in addition to all of these elements that you're kind of like forced to just be like, okay, well, this exists and this is the world and let me get into this, but then also I have to pay attention to this medallion that she's got and now people are going to chase her. And So I think if it were a story about a mob like scenario of a lady who accidentally gets like some jewelry and stuff and then is going to maybe die or her friends are going to die, that's kind of fun. The fact that one of the characters is a gay man named Lizard Wizard who wants to have public sex with an el- or with a goblin uh, yeah. and just constantly uh, sleeps on their couch just, like, ratchets it up, this comic, in such a great way. It honestly never reaches absurdity. It's, like, certainly just a story with, like, kind of just crazy fantasy, I guess. Yeah. 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 Some of the, some of the mon- mundaneness of the entire story was like the funniest part to me that she's just like hanging out with her like stoner roommates and they're having like typical bad party conversations yes and just like taking a step back and looking at the scene that's drawn was just funny oh my goodness there's that rooftop scene where you see this guy (laughs) just full on just kissing what looks to be like a blob a yeah just a blob (laughs) and it's like yeah what you would imagine like a dorm party or like something to be just like with these weird creatures yeah these are young 20 somethings and though they're set in like this fantastic universe or element uh we all here have been in these situations we've all been to these parties where the main goal is just to get drunk and to hook up and do drugs and i think they really balance this theme well between like fun coming of age story with a D and D uh, twist, yeah. So our main character Sage is like yearning for adventure because she's stuck in this job that she has to beta test new software for companies. And so l- let me read the uh, their little primer that they do. Yeah, they say a young ranger woman who came to the city with dreams of adventure. Her drug dealing reptilian wizard roommate and her boisterous dwarf maiden BFF embark on a modern day quest to save the world while struggling to keep their crappy day jobs. So I think that she is actually a ranger. Oh, okay. Like that's her like... Yeah, but it's like kind of jokingly crossed out because now she's doing data entry. Data entry, yeah. 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 I get that. Now. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you don't otherwise pick that up I wouldn't have picked that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That wouldn't have been completely obvious. So I've been doing like a tiny little mental note of like my best new comics type of thing. And I, if we, we did that, I would, I would have thrown flavor in there. I would have thrown Hulk in there. Um, I would have submitted this for best new comic. You know, me too. It kind of came out of nowhere. It's a, a fun little surprise. And it's interesting that it's coming out on Dark Horse. This seemed like a real image mm-hmm. boom setting. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, it has it has a very much like a DIY feel to it. Yeah, just um, the 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 humor, the writing, the illustration. It just seems a little um, off brand for Dark Horse. Mm-hmm. They okay. Another thing that this book kind of like subtly deals with is like social issues. Uh, like it doesn't. Isn't there like a weird? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She comments about how the work guy always like calls her woman. She does. Doesn't she yes. say something about how she he needs to go to training? You are welcome, tiny female. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that sets her off into, like, a list 
of things. She's like, one, no. Yeah, the the whole concept of like HR being introduced into this. <laughs> yeah. Those sorts of things were really funny. One of the funny things that I saw too, which which kind of speaks to like the punk rock attitude of the character and her friends, is that they were complaining about all the like bullshit religious holidays that all the other characters have, which <laughs> if you can imagine, there's like elven holidays and dwarf holidays. And she's just like, man, Craig's part of this cult where he worships <laughs> Flarg. <laughs> he keeps like, leaving freaking pamphlets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, this book is so great. It was really fun to read. I think that there was a genre of 80s kind of like comics that looked like this, like Elf Quest, I think is in the realm of like what this would have been like. Mm-hmm. And I think it's kind of referencing that. And then it's re- referencing modern D&D culture with uh, some some teen kind of like stuff. I guess not teen, but young younger kid kind of drama. Yeah, popular fantasy stuff. That's all getting incorporated into YA. Mm-hmm. A lot of little like anime characters pop up. It's just fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you like anything fantasy and you can still find it, check it. I have a feeling this, there's probably a small run in it, but I bet it's sold out. Next up, we got Teen Titans Special number one on the DC Universe. This is by Glass and Rocha. In the Teen Titans Special, we are left with a world from the aftermath of No Justice. If you didn't read No Justice, don't worry. It's only going to remind you five times that you should have. And I'll tell you what, I almost want to now. Because Teen Titans Special had some crazy ass shit going on in there. We got Robin. Robin is not afraid to kick ass, have a gun, and kill. Yeah, you heard me. Somebody of the Batman family's wielding a metal rod and blasting some heat into motherfucker's face. Then we've got Red Arrow. So this comic is set up in that it's going to introduce you to like the three main Teen Titans and how badass they are. Red Arrow's fighting her mom. Yep, I said that, fighting her mom. They're killing people, they're shattering glass, and they're having a rough old fight, and uh, it gets violent, and she's had enough, and her mom tries to kill her. Yeah. Then we go into Kid Flash. He is trying to save an innocent bystander, but Harley Quinn is going to take this person and essentially, like, capture them, at least he thinks, and this gets raw, Guys, so if you guys don't like raw things, cover up your ears, <laughs> cover up your eyes, because the person that Harley Quinn was taking and capturing wasn't capturing. She fucking killed him, and he finds that person on a boat dead, and Harley Quinn uh, just trolls him totally. It was like, I knew you were going to come here, and this dead body's here. So the theme of Teen Titans is they got raw. They got... Uh, Silly, violent, and they set up a comic that is totally worth buying. This ain't your average Teen Titans kitty stuff. These, these are kids who are ready to kill, and I am pumped on that. They're, like, very conflicted and driven to being ready to kill, though. Each of their stories has something happening to them where it's like, that's the last straw. Kid Flash, that wasn't an innocent person. Isn't that what Wally the Flash was trying to tell him? Is like, oh... This is the Suicide Squad. They have rights to be here and do these things. This person was a criminal that they were taking. They're going to take him back to Amanda Wall or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then he finds out that they killed him instead. Or, or even recruit that person. Right. Because right? the Suicide Squad c- recruits bad guys. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's like his thing, the crux for him. Obviously for Red Arrow, it's her mom poisoning her. Yeah, Ultimately holy shit. being like, Yeah, that was fucked up. That was the most brutal, I think, of all of them. And then for Teen Robin, just realizing that he can't get anything done, he thinks from his perspective without going going raw. <laughs> <laughs> going raw. Uh, well, I just feel like it's so shocking to see, one, any like character that you like have a name for die in a comic book, and then two, have a popular character just hold a gun to a guy's head and kill him, and then we pan out to another scene and find out he killed, like, 20 so guys many. to get to the guy that he you just watched him shoot. So I'm like, 
man, he is f- like completely flying off the handle. Kid Flash and Red Arrow, they went through some stuff that is going to change them potentially, but Damien like popped already. He's uh, gone off the deep end. And I like I don't know how you have a superhero team no. with him at this point, right? I'm he's kind of they cut to Yeah, I'm hoping they cut to like where he's like grappling with it at some point because then there's no redeeming. No, I think he's anti-hero at best. I think they just keep it up. I mean, this is the thing that would happen on like Image. This this book is like Battle Royale, only like they're heroes. And I think that the cool thing, the coolest thing this book could do is just keep it going. Let the violence ensue and just I would not, even if I were writing this book, I would not have them grapple with the gravity of their violence until, like, issue seven. I would just let it run. Well, and I think that's interesting that the DC event going on right now is called New Justice, mostly because there's a new Justice League book, but New Justice. So they went from No Justice... No Justice to New to Justice. New Justice. Mm-hmm. And... I think these Teen Titans are pushed to a point where they're doling out their own type of justice, right? Um, the way they see fit. They've they've all kind of been pushed to that point. They do reference no justice as being mm-hmm. a big cata- like a I think catalyst. They, for they watched a planet blow up or something, yeah. right? What, one of the interesting things that uh, Greg pointed out about this comic was that it was supposed to cameo introduce a new character, so we get a little flash of. Lobo's daughter in a tiny panel at the end. Mm-hmm. And Lobo's known for being a pretty brutal character. So maybe she fits right in with these three in a sense that they've kind of snapped and they're yeah. no holds barred. But I I agree with Mike that they're or I agree with I agree with Budget King where it's just like sooner or later they're gonna have to deal with this sure. new form of justice that yeah. they're doling out. Because I mean Robin's pushed to his final breaking point when the family that looks uh, that the the restaurant that he goes to is blown up by these mafia types and he just he can't live by Batman's standards of how to you know get justice so he's like you know what I'm gonna use a gun I'm gonna just end this because we, we keep putting these people in jail and they keep escaping or getting let out so the only justice is this final justice which is a little bullet to the brain. Which that's not really very new. I mean, you see characters go through that all the time with like struggling of how they can really be most effective versus what they want to become and what they would have to do or not do to stay true to themselves, essentially. But it's different and it's more brutal and it's darker when it's kids. Yeah. And I think that's what's so interesting about this Teen Titans thing is it's not... It's not your green arrow struggling again with do I like go back to killing or do I stay where I'm just I'm putting him away. I almost wasn't going to read this book at all until so Mike D texted like I loved it cuz the front of it is just like Kid Flash, Red Arrow, Robin and then like some like portraiture of like or statues of like Batman and Green Arrow and Flash behind it. It's just Which like, are very telling now. I mean the cover's so telling so after much. you read the book, but yeah. We, we often don't cover one-shots or special event books because they're just a single one-off thing, but this one certainly felt like a catalyst for a bigger thing, so it, it feels more like a truer, number one, important start to something. Mm-hmm. It, I, I'm definitely going to... I've kind of wanted to get into Teen Titans anyway, and yeah. now I'm like, hell yeah, let's just let's see where it goes. Um, Especially when you get that sneak peek of the team they're building, you're like, yeah. okay, well, I'm into these stories. What are they gonna, what oh, are they gonna be about? Totally. They they could have segmented any of the three stories from this into an individual comic, and I yeah. would have been like, we have to cover this book. Yeah. If this was three separate books, I would have been like, all three books we're doing to this week are Teen Titans. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's some longtime DC fans that are pissed that Robin would pull a trigger. I mean, they named a whole series of when Batman first almost killed somebody in the killing joke. Yeah. And it's like here He's already done. Here it's like yeah, free for all. Yeah. No suspense. He did it. He John Wicked Molly Red people. (laughs) Well dearies (laughs) 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 Sorry. I saw 
<laughs> just to <laughs> collapse on himself. So. <clears throat> well, dearies, it's that time to finish off the episode. I've had a wonderful time here talking comic books with my friends, and I hope you had a good time, too. We are produced and edited by our friend Matthew Hodap, who is also a uh, proprietor of the Fountain City Frequency. <laughs> he also is a friend of Primary Color Music. Oh, they're a great band. Yeah, and they're a great podcast music producing entity. He's also a friend of KCUR 89.3 Studios, in which we recorded in. What a beautiful place we are. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I don't even know why I'm doing that voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's the end. And now we're going to be done. Uh, this uh. is Greg Lichtai, signing off. This is Budget King, and could you guys inform me to what a pale grant is? A pale, a pale, 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 pale grant? grant? Am I saying that correctly? <laughs> no. Pell, P-E-L-L, pale, pale grant. Yeah. So my coworker's daughter um, tried coming to her, telling her she got this fancy scholarship <laughs> once, <laughs> and her mom was like, "What is it?" And she was like, "It's a pale grante." <laughs> <laughs> She was like, oh, you're slick. <laughs> but not smart enough. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's a it's a grant. It's for people who need financial aid. Uh, I'm Caitlin Morosic, and I, I, I'll show myself out. I'm Mike DeStacy, and I'm running around a carousel saying, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you too. God. <laughs> Bye.